Good evening, and thank you for joining us this evening for Historic Alexandria's Hispanic American Heritage Month lecture featuring Dr. Enrique Pumar from Santa Clara University. First, a few housekeeping notes. We are set up tonight as a webinar, so your microphones are automatically muted. Please leave questions for Dr. Pumar in the chat function, and I will ask them at the end of the lecture. Dr. Pumar is the Faye Boyle Professor and Chair of the University's Department of Sociology, which he joined in 2017. He currently chairs the section on the Sociology of Development at the American Sociological Association and is affiliated with, affiliated with the Institute for the Study of International Migration at Georgetown University. In 2017, he was a Fulbright Senior Scholar at the University of Valladolid in Spain. And in the fall of 2017, Dr. Pumar was named visiting lecturer at the Cultural Institute Felix Barrea in La Habana, Cuba, a degree-granting institution sponsored by the Vatican. The author of over 50 publications, he serves in the editorial board of multiple academic journals, including Sociological Forum, and is the contributing editor for Sociology for the Handbook of Latin American Studies, published by the Library of Congress. Dr. Pomar also frequently provides expert analysis of social issues for various media outlets, including CNN and Univision. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Enrique Pomar. Thank you, Daniel, uh, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to everyone that has joined us today. And most, most important, uh, my sincere appreciation to the City of Alexandria Office of Historic Alexandria for sponsoring the lecture and for facilitating the, the virtual arrangements uh, so that we can be together today. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the trips, uh, or, or the trip, I should say, that Domingo Sarmiento, a public intellectual in Latin America of Argentinian background, uh, took to the United States in 1947. Uh, I'm gonna try to argue that this trip is extremely relevant to understand uh, the growth of the Hispanic community in the Washington DC area. And also uh, because of his contribution to the understanding of the United States, and also popularizing the notion of the United States as a preferred destination for many uh, immigrants that will come later on after his trip. Sarmiento is also a very, very controversial figure, uh, as you will see later on today. And uh, finally, one of the reasons why his, his trip is very relevant is because despite the fact that he wrote extensively about the United States and very sympathetically, um, he has been overlooked by historians. His trip uh, is rarely cited, or in many cases, a study uh, by experts uh, on the field. So I think there are many, many reasons why we should pay attention to his writing and uh, the, his account uh, of his travel uh, to the United States. Some of the accounts is uh, very, very profound and others uh, quite funny. Uh, like for instance, when he was stuck in Baltimore trying to, uh, to make it to Washington DC, um, he took a train and the train happened to have an accident and Sarmiento uh, basically was delayed in Baltimore. Something that I think we all uh, can relate to uh, today uh, either when we travel by train or we take a 95. And then he has some uh, very uh, profound words about the city and what uh, the city uh, illustrates uh, with regard to democracy and, and as the nation capital. So anyway, we have a lot to talk about and uh, very provocative ideas. So hopefully this will generate a lot of questions uh, later on uh, during the Q&A. So what I'm planning to do uh, today, I'm planning to organize my, my lecture into uh, these uh, seven points that we have here. I'm gonna start talking about the demography of, uh, of the Washington DC and demographic composition of the Hispanic community. And I think this is important to make for the point that I'm going to, to try to make with, about the relevance of, of some, or one of the relevance of Sarmiento's uh, visit to the area. Uh, I'm going to raise some, what I consider to be some important questions and then uh, try to give you my uh, explanation of it. Uh, 
And then uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about, we're gonna immerse ourselves in history by talking about uh, the uh, writers and travelers uh, that uh, came through the United States uh, during the 19th century and many of them of Hispanic uh, background. Uh, and then we would focus on Sarmiento and why he came and you know what some of his reflections and then at the end, uh, the significance of his travel. So let me, let me start off with the contemporary to give you an idea of how um, internationalized uh, the DMV region is and how much the presence of the, of, of the Hispanic community, uh, Hispanic Latino community has contributed to uh, that internationalization of, this, of, the, of the region. I started off by doing research on the Washington community uh, back in the uh, early 2000s when I was asked to write a chapter for a book and I became fascinated by how little information I was able to find uh, when I was researching uh, that chapter. But by 2014, Washington was already ranked uh, 12 among the, the top 60 uh, metro areas with the highest concentration of Hispanic and Latino population. This was a, a tremendous growth I arrived in Washington myself in the uh, 19, 1987, 1988. Uh, so in a very short amount of time, Washington climbed into one of the uh, prominent uh, areas with, with a Hispanic presence around the United States. And this, this in itself uh, invites a lot of reflection and a lot of, uh, a lot of thinking as to why this is the case. Uh, so so that, that in itself is important. Uh, if you look at the Hispanic composition and how it's, it's distributed, uh, right now about 16% of the population of the DMV, according to the census, identify themselves as Hispanic or Latinos. And you could see uh, how it's distributed among some municipalities. So in the case of Alexandria, Alexandria has a very high concentration, much higher than Ar Arlington. This wasn't the case many years ago uh, when Arlington uh, had more concentration of Hispanics than Alexandria uh, had. And the district uh, you know, falls uh, someone behind. Uh, so this tells, tells you, tell us a lot about how the population moves in Washington, why it moves to certain areas. And I would say, it also says a lot about the, the effect of gentrification and how gentrification displaces some populations around uh, in search for more affordable housing. Although it's very difficult to argue that th there is much affordable housing in Alexandria. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful area and, and it, you know, there is always more demand uh, for the housing that, than what exists despite the a tremendous growth that you see when you drive around a US one uh, going into King Street. Um, with regard to the, uh, when you look at the population, the foreign born population in Alexandria, you see that the Hispanics uh, also represent the majority or, or the, the most, the largest group, put it that way. So 34% of the foreign born population in Alexandria is of Hispanic descent, uh, in, at, at least in uh, 2019. And the, the foreign born population was identified at 26% in the city of Alexandria. So very, very cosmopolitan and, and, and you know, very, um, the Hispanics uh, are very well uh, represented and not only in, in Alexandria, but in other municipalities uh, as well. So it's fair to say that uh, there is number one, a, a good growth of the Hispanic community uh, in, you know, in the last say 20 years or so. And then number two, it's fair to say that it's well represented in many municip municipalities and in many cases represents the, the largest uh, group in the area, okay? What are some important questions? Well, the first and most important is what accounts for this demographic shift in DC? Why many Hispanics uh, begin to, to come uh, to Washington? Why they settle in the Washington area? And then uh, also 
uh, some important questions when we consider uh, uh, Sarmiento is uh, how his writings and that of other uh, public intellectuals contribute to the Latin American identity. And then obviously the, the inevitable question is why should we care? What should we care about it? Let me, before I share my, my next slide, let me talk to you a little bit about the first question. If you look at the Hispanic community in Washington DC, there is a, a pattern. There is a pattern that is important to, to take into account when we, if we, it's important to take history into account. This is what we call the path dependence uh, growth of the community. History is very important because you could see that this pattern uh, represents different phases of the history of the community in the Washington area. During the 19th century, there were many travelers that came and basically came into DC and, and they would go and they would stay for a short periods of time. But there, there, there was, there is no evidence that there was a Hispanic community per se residing in, in the Washington area. Okay. There was no permanent significant population of Hispanic during the 19th century in, in Washington, DC. However, this population began to grow in the 20th century. And I believe that there are two reasons why this is the case. The first is because of the growth of institutions, many institutions that serve Latin America, for example, the Pan American Health Organ Organization, later on the OAS, uh, the Hispanic Division of the Library of Congress, and you know, later on in the 50s, the Inter-American Development Bank, Alliance for Progress, so on and so on, the OAS. Uh, many, all of these institutions changed the composition of the community. It brought in a particular uh, type of uh, Hispanic to Washington, uh, primarily, a Hispanic that was middle class, well educated, um, had perhaps a, a graduate degree, um, and came to basically to take advantage of many of those jobs, and also many of the jobs in the federal government. However, uh, starting around 19, the mid 1960s, the community began to be, began to be more diverse. And today, uh, the, the Hispanic community in DC is one of the most representatives in the nation. Practically every group, every class, every social interest is represented in the community. And of course, to, to finalize uh, this history or this overview, uh, the, the growth accelerated uh, rapidly in the late 70s and early 70s, early, in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, with the civil wars in Central America and how uh, these conflicts uh, displaced a lot of people um, who became political refugees. Okay. So uh, there is a path dependence, historical process and institutions are very important. But tonight I'm gonna argue that there is another reason why um, Hispanics came, became attractive to Washington. And that is because the early writers of the 19th century created what I would call an imagined destination, a preferred destination that gave way to, to this uh, new gateway, new immigrant gateway that we call the DMV today. Uh, this is very, very important because uh, demographers uh, in, in, around Washington, some of them at Brookings Institute, have documented really, really well the population growth. However, they have a really hard time trying to explain why this growth began. And, and this is the purpose of my presentation today, to, to try to offer a, at least a possible explanation of why this growth began. Where did it start? Why did people begin to pay attention to DC? Besides the fact that institutions attracted certain labor uh, uh, to, to the area. Why was, because if you think about it, uh, a, lot of a lot of people who come to DC to work, they could eventually leave. But uh, although some of that took place, it is also the case that many stay behind and, and eventually form 
a very, a very vibrant uh, community. So that's one of the relevance of, of that ties the history with the contemporary is the fact that uh, I sincerely believe that these writers uh, and the popularity of these writers and, and when they went back home, I, because they were public intellectual, public figures, they wrote in newspapers all over Latin America, that created a, a, a push, if you will, to bring people to, to, to the uh, DC area. It is very important to keep in mind that Washington DC in many regards had a disadvantage over other areas. For example, uh, we know that New York is a, a traditional immigrant destination because of the type of economy that uh, dominates in New York City. And as you will find out today, during the 19th century, there was a very large Hispanic community in Philadelphia as well. However, um, that makes, again, my argument, I think, more compelling because then the, the question is, if Washington DC didn't have the economic attractiveness of New York or, or the appeal uh, during the early 20th century and, and late 19th century of Philadelphia, why people began to fluctuate into this area. And I think that uh, this notion of an imagined destination at least give, give us uh, some uh, reason to reflect uh, uh, to what extent uh, it contributed to this process. All right, let me now turn, turn you know, we already covered a lot of the contemporary uh, perspective. Let's talk a little bit about history here. It is, it, and, and the, the, this, this particular history is to contextualize the, the reason why Sarmiento uh, came to the United States and more importantly, why he visited uh, Washington DC, okay? Um, I will tell you a little bit about his itinerary later on, but for now, let's just talk about the context. Why, why was he coming here? What's going on in the 19th century that made um, Sarmiento, you know, uh, come to the United States and try to, uh, to, to observe a particular phenomenon that he was very much interested in, and that is the process of education. Uh, fair to say that people came for many, many reasons. You're, just like today, people came to the United States for many, many reasons, and not necessarily because, of, because they were economic migrants. Many of them, the majority of them were political refugees. Uh, some came because of, of the curiosity that the United States represented, and I will talk a little bit more about that. Others came to Washington DC and to, and to the Eastern part of the United States to lobby the federal government to support uh, their nations and, and the cause for independence from Spain. We have to keep in mind that South America and Central America became independent from Spain in 1822. However, the Caribbean nations much later during the Spanish-American War in 1895. So there was a gap of time there where many Latin Americans joined in solidarity to try to uh, push uh, the Spaniards out of uh, the Spanish Caribbean. And for that reason, many, many came uh, to Washington DC to lobby for that, to lobby for help. Uh, finally, uh, some immigrants came to, to the United States also to set up commercial activities. Uh, this is the case, for example, in Tampa when uh, Ivor, um, the, the so-called Ivor city, it was formed. Ivor was a, a Spaniard uh, cigar maker who owned a cigar factory. And um, he was disturbed by the amount of political rancor and mobilization uh, that, he had, that, that he witnessed in Key West and took a ferry and went up north. And that ferry tied Key West to Tampa and he found himself in Tampa and you know, founded his, his town there, uh, which is adjacent, is part of Tam uh, the, the city of Tampa today and established his factory and the rest is history. So there were many, many reasons um, why uh, Latinos came to the United States during the 19th century. I cited some examples here. Uh, the one that I would like to emphasize is the, the case of Narciso Lopez. And Narciso Lopez is a very, very intriguing personality. He uh, is from Venezuela and he fought uh, against Bolivar 
you know, in favor of the Spaniards. And then uh, when the Spaniards lost, he went and took refuge in Cuba. And when during his residence in Cuba, he had a change of heart and left his allegiance for Spain and began to uh, act again against Spain. And for that reason, he was persecuted and he came to the city of New Orleans uh, as a political refugee and made, it, made his way to Washington DC to the east, eastern part of the United States for two reasons. Number one, he wanted to collect money. And number two, he wanted to organize uh, an expedition to basically uh, kick the Spaniards out of Cuba. And he almost succeeded. He landed in Cuba, uh, you know, was able to, uh, to, to, have, to, to establish a stronghold there for a, for, for a while, but, but then eventually lost the battle and, and the rest is history. So very complex history, very rich history. And I think it's fair to say that uh, the 19th century is in many ways a, a Hispanic, a, a, has a Hispanic presence in, in the history of the United States, which is often over, overlooked. Now, let me make, make, uh, mention another point before we move on, and that is why did many public intellectuals began to come to the United States in the middle of the 19th century? For this, we have to talk a little bit about uh, so the, the geopolitical history of the hemisphere. As I said before, uh, there was a war of independence, 1822, the Spaniards were kicked out of South America and, and, and Mexico and Central America. And in a very convenient fashion, in 1823, the United States declared the Monroe Doctrine. And, and this made the United States a, an ally of uh, the newly formed nations, because the newly formed nations didn't want, didn't want any interference from European powers because they wanted to prosper and they wanted to organize themselves. So in the language of today, I think it's fair to say that between the Monroe Doctrine and uh, the Spanish-American War, the United States was regarded as an anti-colonialist uh, power, uh, a, a, a country that was pushing for, for self-determination and was trying to uh, you know, deter Inf the influence of Europeans in Latin America. Of course, some would argue there was a hidden interest behind this, uh, but nonetheless, the, the truth of the matter is that the United States sided with the newly independent nations and leaders. And because of that reason, this attracted many public intellectuals because they wanted to see the American experiment with democracy, with social reforms, with the schools, they wanted to see how the cities were organized. Um, they wanted to uh, contemplate uh, to what extent the United States and the development of the United States was a model that they could emulate in their own country. So that explains why many of these figures that I mentioned here uh, came in the, in the mid 19th century and the, in the latter part of the 19th century. All right, so who was San Miento? Sarmiento uh, was, a, as I said before, an Argentina, Argentine, a public intellectual diplomat and a statement um, who came from very humble or, orients. Um, he will be what we, call, what we call today a first generation a Latin American. Um, basically, uh, he was born and raised in the city of San Juan, uh, certain distance outside uh, Buenos Aires, not in the capital city. Uh, this is very important because this formed his political career and his views about uh, nation building. And his father fought against the Spaniards. Um, this, uh, this, this historical uh, fact is important because as we will see uh, later on, uh, Sarmiento's associated anything of Hispanic descent, anything associate, associated from, with Spain as barbaric. Okay? And, and this is one of the reasons why he's so controversial. And one of the many reasons why um, some people in Latin America today 
um, don't really read too much about his writings because um, he, he had a very provocative, but yet a very simplistic view of uh, the Latin American culture. You know, he, uh, he, he basically uh, looked at it as a very sort of um, bipolar situation. You are either one situation or the other. And I'm gonna tell you what those are. Uh, I don't wanna get ahead of myself. Um, Samiento came to the United States twice. The first time in 1847, which is the period that I'm going to cover in my lecture. Uh, and then uh, he went back uh, and he came back as, a, as an Argentine ambassador to Washington DC in 1865. And in, in that year, he was already a celebrated and provocative public intellectual. So the University of Michigan gave Sarmiento an honorary doctorate degree. And this is something that made him extremely proud very, very happy because of uh, his Humboldt origins. He had trouble finishing school. In fact, he finished most of his education when he was in exile in Chile uh, as a result of his political activities. So the fact that he made it uh, from a Humboldt origins to have a, a, a doctorate, a honorary doctorate from a, a well-known public institution in the country that he revered uh, made uh, Sarmiento very, very proud indeed, and very, very, um, you know, very uh, satisfied and more committed uh, to his ideas of defending the United States as the, uh, the model to emulate in Latin America. Sarmiento became president of Argentina a uh, few years later. By the way, when he was, um, when he was sent to the United, in the United States in 18, 1865, um, he was sent here because the uh, ruler of Argentina wanted to pretty much get rid of him. He was already becoming very popular. And in Latin America, we have a tradition, as you, uh, all of you probably know, when we have a, a, a politician, a rival politician that we want to get rid of, we we give them an ambassadorial post uh, someplace uh, far away. We, we take them, you know, uh, get, get them out of, out, of, out of sight. And this, is, this, this was the case with the second trip uh, of, of, uh, of Sarmiento's. Sarmiento was also very dedicated to education. Um, he believed that education was the way to overcome um, poverty, deprivation, to have some degree of upward mobility, and also to, uh, to achieve uh, the, the, the national development goals of the nation. Uh, this, these theories uh, resonate today. Um, uh, today we call this uh, human capital. And economists who do economic development pay a great deal of attention to the effect of human capitals on nations and the importance of education uh, to get uh, nations basically uh, moving forward, especially in this uh, now post-industrial revolution in which we live. Samento became a, a very controversial and famous figure uh, when he published in 1845, two years before coming to the United States, a book that he called uh, Civilization y Barbarie civilization and barbaric. And this book was published when he was in exile in Chile. And in many ways, uh, provoke the fact that he took this journey outside uh, uh, Chile. When he published uh, the book, he was already a journalist and, and, a, and an essayist. And he was really a, a controversial person uh, to the point, so, so, so much to, and to the point that the Argentine government complained to the Chileans as to, you know, what, why, why are you espousing this person here? You need, you need to control him. He's causing a lot of problems for us. And as we know, the, the, uh, the, the, the history between Chile and Argentina is, is a contentious one because of the, because of border conflicts and disputes. So the Chileans decided to, that the best way to 
get rid of Sarmiento was to commission him on a long trip to look for pedagogical practices and educational practices around the world that he could then bring to Chile and obviously to Argentina because Sarmiento always had the intention to return and, and to modernize the education in those countries. So for that reason, uh, Sarmiento, what, Sarmiento was sent abroad, okay? So um, again, uh, why he came to the United States? Well, uh, uh, you already know the, the main reason was that he came here to, to study the education uh, of this country. He wanted to see how education promoted democracy, uh, to what extent education, uh, public education, how, how it was organized, and how it served uh, the majority of, of the population at the time. Uh, before I tell you a little bit more about the trip, let me say that uh, Sarmiento started his trip by going to North Africa, then he crossed over to Spain and, 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 um, and France, and then he went to England, and from England, he crossed the, the Atlantic and came to the United States. And he wanted to meet uh, prominent educators at the time. So uh, he met uh, with Horace Mann in Massachusetts and Horace Mann referred him to, to see Henry Barnard, uh, another prominent uh, educator and Sarmiento met with them. And then he made his way south on the Eastern seaboard uh, until he got to Washington, eventually after Washington went to Pittsburgh and in Pittsburgh, he made his way through New Orleans to the Mississippi River and from New Orleans to Cuba and to, from Cuba, he went down to South America. So it was a very, very long trip, uh, but nonetheless for, for Samiento, uh, very fruitful because it uh, allowed him to witness firsthand uh, this country that he had admired uh, so much and, and that he had advocated as a model for others to, to emulate. All right, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about some of the observations that Sarmiento made during his trip. And in order to do that, I'm going to read you a few passages of a book that collected uh, some of the writings of Sarmiento, and, and then I will elaborate a little bit on, on, uh, on these passages. Okay, so let me start off by telling you a little bit about his working of democracy. And, and here, um, he, uh, he, he basically uh, had a particular observation about the electoral system in which he recognizes that although it was very promising, it was still not perfect in the United States, but yet uh, he found uh, that it was, if there was a place where, that would perfect the, this new organization of politics was, uh, was the United States. So, so Samiento says, the electoral system is a still a chaos which must be reduced to order, a seed which has just barely been fertilized and only in the United States and, and has, has it matured enough for there to have been a fair amount of experience with it. So again, uh, uh, he recognizes uh, that it was a work in progress, but this doesn't det didn't deter uh, his hope uh, for uh, for, to, to, uh, to, to identify the United States as a, a promising a, a perfectionist of this system in the future. One of the most um, vivid accounts of democracy is when he arrived in Washington and he went to visit the White House. And, um, you know, he wandered around Lafayette Park. So if I'm gonna read you this passage because I think it's, it's a little bit funny, especially when we think about uh, how the White House is fortified to date and how Lafayette Park um, has functioned or perhaps has ceased to function as a park because of security concerns. So as, as I'm, I read this to you, uh, please try to, uh, in your mind, compare this description to what we have today in Washington. He says, referring to the White House, the interior of the palace is passably decorated, although not as it should be for a president. 
of the United States. So this, this called a lot of attention to him because uh, he, he basically believed that uh, even though for many people, the, uh, the White House is very opulent, when Sarmiento compared the White House with what he had experienced in South America and, and Europe, it was very modest uh, for him. He says, the appointments of the palace are modest and even uh, mean in outward appearance. You can see the president walking along the beautiful path of the adjacent uh, garden. There are one or two porters in uniform, the only servants the state puts at his service. The president is not permitted to have bodyguards. The president receives without ceremony those who wish to see him. And there is one day in the week and two or three special days in the year in of which the, the, anyone has a right to enter the room of, of the president. On July 4th, the day of rejoicing, Lafayette Park is filled with visitors. Uh, the falls get down uh, and they're on their carriage and follow the coachman. Arriving before the president, they extend a colossal hand and squeeze and shake his hand forcefully, looking him, uh, looking him in the face and a smiling good nature with satisfaction. Returning to the horses, they turn every, uh, every few steps to get a last pleasurable and self-congratulatory peek at the president. And then he says, poor president of a democracy. In other words, one of his observations about the United States that he admired so much at the time was how accessible public officials were in the middle of the 19th century when uh, Sarmiento visited the city. And this uh, profoundly shaped uh, his, his notion of democracy and, and his promise that although the democratic system was not uh, perfected uh, by any means, he was able to observe that, it was a, definitely a promising work in progress. He, he actually uh, reiterated this point when he had a conversation with an elected member of Congress uh, of the Democratic Party. And the elected member of Congress at the time told him, don't be fooled by what you're witnessing. Behind the scenes, there is a lot of despair and frustration and uh, a lot of rancor among the parties, something that we are quite familiar today. But that didn't deter Sarmiento from uh, trying to criticize uh, the democratic process. On the contrary, Sarmiento reassured this elected official that this was part of, a de of the democracy, a part of the, or a democracy where people had the right to organize, to express their opinion, uh, to basically argue with one another in a way that he hasn't seen uh, before. Another uh, aspect of uh, Sarmiento's, which is very, I find very interesting, is how he begins to equate architecture with progress. And, and this is uh, something that he, uh, he talks a lot about, especially when he talks about urban planning. Uh, and basically uh, he says at one point during his writings, the American have a knack for reducing everything to a science, applying a common sense and functionalism to all things. And then he says, the American have invented a city plan which takes into account all of these factors. And he was talking about uh, questions of socialization and you know the designs of a space in the cities and so forth. And then he says the block is or can be a song 140 not rods long, but it is also 30 and 50 in depth so that the houses can face uh, can face on both uh, sides of the street and the city can be populated advantageously. So uh, he looks at, at, at um, city uh, planning as, as a way of accentuated this idea of progress that uh, he, he, in his mind, characterized uh, the United States. He has a very, very uh, interesting observations about um, 
for example, one of his observations, very interesting, is about the, the street signs in the United States. He said the street signs in the United States are actually elegant and they don't have misspellings and you know they they indicate they guide you in the right direction and he says that is notorious or, or a society that is civilized again he tries to uh, associate civility with uh, the organization of the city now when he came to washington dc he was not very flattering and this this is also very significant because uh, this explains, in some regard, the, what, the point that I made in the beginning of my talk, which is that among Hispanics, many or, or the majority of Hispanics in the 19th century went to other places, did not stay sufficiently long in Washington, D.C. to say that there was a Hispanic community. They, they lived in Philadelphia, they lived in New York, um, down in Florida and in other places but not in DC. And part of the reason is uh, because of how um, Sarmiento characterized the city. And again, not in very flattering terms. Let me read you what he said. He says, in the United States, there is no capital, strictly speaking, or rather according to the Latin meaning of the word. You see this on contemplating the relative isolation of that mo uh, monument, he was referring to the Washington Monument, thrown up if by chance in the city, in the center of the town, which is the center of nothing, neither the country's geography, nor of its intelligence, nor of its wealth, not of its culture, not of its communication system. So not a very flattering um, uh, description of Washington DC, and this was reiterated later on when he says, Washington, the nominal capital of the union will in the near future, without doubt, take advantage of these tendencies of the national character. If the capital and the museum of inventions and the movement put up for Washington are accompanied by other attractions, which are at, at last, which at, at last may make of the capital a center of spectacle, which will uh, excite the curiosity of travelers and awaken nation nationalism. As, as, the, as the residence of senators and department secretaries and other high functionaries and of representative of other nations, Washington should be, uh, uh, should be able to beautify its nightlife with the opera, with drama, with the ballet, assuming religious ideas do not put a strong obstacle on the way. So you could see uh, that, again, this is a very, the way I interpret uh, this overall impression of DC is almost very paradoxical. On the one hand, um, he, was, he was very attractive by the scenery, uh, by the mountains around DC, by, by the architecture of the city, by how well the city was organized. But on the other hand, uh, he was not very flattered when it came to uh, the city as a culture, as a cultural center, which, is, which of course it is today. Uh, this has to do a lot with the Latin American uh, tradition of urban planning. In Latin American tradition, the capital city is the center of everything in the country, uh, the center of finance, culture, politics, so on and so forth. But in the United States, uh, this is not, not necessarily the case. And this is something that Sarmiento uh, didn't uh, understand very well. Before I tell you, uh, I, I close by telling you a little bit about the implications of his travel. Let me tell you a little bit about his overall impressions of the United States. This is captured in a letter that he published on November 12, 1847, when he says, the United States is something without presence, a kind of extravaganza which at first shocks and runs counter to one previous ideas about it, but which is great and noble, occasionally sublime, never disappointing. Okay? And then later on, uh, he says, um, he talks about the American people and one of the characteristics of the American, the American people and, and how they made the country 
Gray uh, um, in his, in his uh, observation, and he says, what is more characteristic of, of them, referring to the American, is their ability to appropriate for their own use, generalize, popularize, conserve, and perfect all practices and tools and methods and aids which the most advanced civilization has put in the hands of men. In this, the United States is unique in this earth. There are no unconquerable habits that re retard for centuries the adoption of an obvious improvement. And on the other hand, there is a predisposition to try everything. And he goes on to say that this is something that he didn't observe during his travels in Europe. Again, the dichotomy that Sarmiento um, talks about between barbaric and civilization. And, and for him, everything that had to do with uh, Europe was in many ways a barbaric and the United States represented the hope of civilization of the future. Now, um, I said in my PowerPoint, I put two, two bullet points, uh, migration and slavery. I'm not gonna read you what he says, but uh, let me say uh, th that uh, he has a passage in which is very clear uh, criticizes the migration of Europeans to the United States at the time. Uh, this is a time when uh, Irish Americans were coming to the United States, many German Americans were coming to the United States. The first wave of mass migration uh, to the United States um, at the time. And, and Sarmiento thought that uh, these immigrants would eventually uh, or potentially uh, corrupt the American spirit. Uh, this is something that is quite controversial because he himself uh, was an immigrant. Uh, he was a political exile in Chile, and, and yet he didn't have a very high regard for the European influence in the United States. With regard to uh, slavery, he was very clear. He said that it was the biggest mistake the founding fathers ever made. And, and the biggest mistake was that he, the founding fathers allowed the Southerners uh, to hold uh, slavery, to hold the slaves. So he was very, very clear about that, uh, very critical of, of that part of the history of the United States. All right, let me close in by, by talking about why Sarmiento's uh, travel matter. Uh, first of all, as, as we say, uh, we say, I said in the beginning, Today, the Washington DC area is very cosmopolitan and very diverse with a growing Hispanic community. And yet uh, many of these travelers that came through Washington DC have been largely overlooked uh, and the influence and the impact that they had have been uh, largely overlooked by many historians. Second, I think it is very important that uh, Sarmiento saw the rise of the United States. It is probably fair to say that the United States rose to a power, a, a sort of a, a power status, a international power status after the Spanish-American War, and especially in the early part of the, of the 20th century. And Sarmiento foresaw that rise by uh, uh, putting a lot of hope into the process of democracy and by uh, basically uh, expressing confidence uh, that the United States was the country in which uh, new ideas would take place and some ideas that were a work in progress uh, would be repaired uh, as was the case of, of democracy. He was very complementary to the, to, to the process of political participation and democracy and especially to the pragmatism that guided the political culture in the United States already in the, in the 19th century. Most importantly, Sarmiento also had a profound effect on the identity of Latin America, something that we still are grappling with today. So when Sarmiento wrote his famous book, Facundo, Civilization and Barbaric, in 1845, that generated an important debate. And that important debate was 
what model should we adopt as we look at the future of our own region? What, is, what should be the identity of many of our countries uh, with regard to our own future? Who should we imitate? Sarmiento, of course, was on the side of the United States. He promoted the idea that the United States was the best model to imitate uh, for the future. But that also created a counter argument, a counter argument that was very, very strong uh, among many intellectuals, some of them who lived in the United States much later on uh, than Sarmiento. And these intellectuals were basically saying, no, the United States uh, model may not work in Latin America. What we need to do is to, uh, to think of, of ourselves and to find so our own solutions to our own problems, to, to the model that we wanna be in the future. We need to find our own, our own solutions to, the, to this, these concerns. And of course, uh, to, find, to, to end, um, this debate about the promise of the United States and what the promise of the United States is not, is not only present among Latin American nations, but it's also present among the Hispanic community. In the last presidential election, a good portion of Hispanics voted a Republican and a good portion voted Democrat. And if you pay attention to what these two political affiliations say about the United States, uh, a, lot of, a, lot of it is, a, a lot of this affiliation questioned to what extent the United States still represents uh, the American dream that guided this nation and, and the model uh, for which many of these immigrants uh, decided to settle uh, here in, the, in, in this country. Thank you so much. I hope that I have raised uh, enough uh, uh, points, provocative points to have a conversation and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So if you have a question, can you please leave it in the chat? Um, I'd first like to start off um, with a question for Dr. Pumar. Um, given that um, Sarmiento used his public intellectual um, status as a means to get political power, um, how feasible is that in today's Argentina? Um, well, it, it, in Latin America, as a uh, overall, and 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 in, uh, including Argentina. It is fairly feasible, and it's fairly feasible uh, because, uh, Daniel, in Latin America, we have a different conception of a public intellectual. In the United States, uh, we have many public intellectuals that uh, find different venues to articulate their ideas. They write editorial pieces in the New York Times, in the Washington Post. They write books. They give lectures. Uh, George Will, for example, is a primary example. Paul Krugman with the New York Times. But in Latin America, the public intellectual is very engaged, very, very engaged. And, and what, I'm, I'm, what I mean by that is that the public intellectual is not just writing um, you know, for the masses, is not just trying to make sense of the current situation. He uh, and she, uh, they try to do something about it. Latin American public intellectual are engaged and try to be active and do something about it. And some of them run for office, like for example, Vargas Llosa, who run unsuccessfully uh, to be the president of Peru fairly recently, fairly recently historical times, of course. And uh, you have Fernando Enrique Cardoso, a very important economist who actually became president of, of, of Brazil. And then you have other intellectuals have, uh, get, are engaged because they, uh, they create their own foundations and these foundations dedicate themselves to publish books and essays and journals. Octavio Paz come to mind, uh, who didn't have a political ambition to be president, but yet he was very much engaged in Mexico through his publications and uh, through, uh, many of the, you know, the foundations and, and the groups that he, he patronized. So, so in Latin America, the, the notion of a public intellectual is very, very different. Uh, and, and Sarmiento is, is one in a very long history uh, that we don't see in the United States. In the United States, 
very few of these intellectuals bother to enter the political arena um, in comparison with Latin America. Thank you. Did anyone else have a, a question for Dr. Pumar? Well, in this case, it, it looks like Sarmiento wasn't provocative enough. They didn't get a lot of questions, but, but I assure you that, um, that he was indeed a, a very, very controversial uh, person and uh, I'm very, uh, very engaged for sure. When you say that he was opposed to immigration to Argentina, um, especially um, European or immigration to the United States, um, yes. especially European, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, sure. What uh, at, at one point in his writings, when he took a copious notes of his writings, and at one point, he basically says that uh, the, the Europeans that were coming were first generation uh, European migrants that were, that were coming here for economic reasons. And as such, he, he didn't see them as being uh, uh, very educated uh, in his view and as a corrupting the fabric, the social fabric of the country. Again, let me read you uh, some of the passage, although again, the language is, is a little bit harsh, but nonetheless, I think I should answer your question. He says, in the United States, European immigration is a barbaric element. Uh, who, would have, who, who would have believed it? Except for natural exceptions, the European, Irishman, German, Frenchman, and Spaniards come from the neediest classes is usually ignorant and is not accustomed to, to the republic practice of the land. How can it be, how can it, how can, how can he be assured that, that the immigrant will at once understand the complicated mechanisms of municipal, state, national institution, and more important, that he will become like the Yankee in his love for every one of these linking his existence to his very being uh, to them in such a way that he would, he would fear for his life of conscience. If, if he neglect this institution and what, uh, if, if he neglect, neglected this institution and what they represent. So in other words, um, as you see, can see not a very flattering account of the, um, of the first large immigration wave of immigrants to the United States. Uh, this is, I mean, it's, it's very controversial and it's very difficult to absorb, but uh, those of us who have migrated to other countries, uh, we know that there is usually a misperception associated with migration. And sometimes, uh, individuals tend to fault immigrants for things that go wrong. So if there is too much traffic, it's because the immigrants are driving too much. They, many of them have driving license. So, uh, you know, if, if, they, if, if there, there is no space in the public park, it's because they're playing soccer and so on and so forth. So uh, this is something that we, we see time and time again um, with practically every migration. In the West, we saw it with Asian migration and with Chinese immigrants. Uh, we saw it in the East. Um, again, it's, it's something that is fairly common, but nonetheless disturbing and controversial because uh, he obviously generalized and he um, depicted a, a group of people that came here and eventually made a tremendous contribution uh, to this country. And he depicted uh, these groups in a very unfavorable, uh, unfavorable way. So one of our uh, attendees asked, um, could you please describe in some more detail what Sarmiento meant by the differences between civilization and the barbaric? Sure, so uh, in his book uh, and in many of his writings, um, Sarmiento be, began to, to, to talk about the fact that as we looked at uh, a nations that, you know, for, let's say have, have become nations recently, 
they were decolonized, uh, countries that were in the process of reorganizing themselves, what we would call today developing societies. Uh, um, he says that there are usually two tendencies that are, are over, over, that overtake and, and overpower uh, the, the, the social fabric and the, the culture and the political debate in those countries. And those tendencies are what he, what he referred to as barbaric, which it, it, I think it's fair to say today what, that will be characterized as the legacy of colonialism. He characterized that barbaric. And remember, in Latin America, the colonial power was Spain. So anything related to Spain, associated with Spain, was uh, for Sarmiento the, a part of this legacy of colonialism. And uh, on the other hand, you have the hope of the future. And the hope for the future is anything that uh, contradicts uh, the presence of, of this legacy of, of colonialism. So, so uh, the, Sarmiento saw the path moving forward as dichotomous. Um, he saw that there were two forces that were struggling uh, for almost supremacy in, in, in Latin America at the time. Uh, and, and again, one was a legacy left behind by Spain, uh, which he, he thought, saw as very detrimental. And the other one, the promise of the future, uh, which the United States represented um, in many ways, the, the best illustration of that. You know, the, the fact that uh, a different country, different political system, a different way of, of organizing our lives, different ways of uh, conducting our everyday, our everyday lives, and, and the potential uh, that that would promise uh, towards the future. So, so he, he saw uh, this, these two dichotomous tendencies as, as you know, fighting for supremacy in, 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 in Latin America. And, and he saw himself and the role of many public intellectuals as guiding the nations of Latin America forward, away from uh, the legacy of colonialism. Um, was there anything in Sarmiento's early years that made an impact on him regarding the civilization versus barbarism dichotomy? Sure. So, so of course, uh, the, his upbringing um, was extremely important to form his early political views. Um, as I said before, he, he was brought up in a remote town of Argentina called San Juan, uh, away from Buenos Aires, who was a very cosmopolitan capital city and continues to be very cosmopolitan capital city of the country, the center of most of the activity. So by definition, Sarmiento was brought up in a very traditional uh, society, isolated uh, from uh, the advantages of living in the city. And, and because it was very traditional, it was ruled very much, even though the Spaniards have been politica, politically kicked out of Argentina, the legacy of the, of the Spanish culture was still there. And, and this is something that Sarmiento resented very much. Resented very much for a number of reasons. The first, and I think very important, his father fought against the Spaniards and his father, uh, by all accounts, was not a very good, um, you know, what we would expect to a regular father. Uh, he couldn't keep a job, uh, often uh, travel outside the, the home, leaving Sarmiento with his mom uh, behind in some uh, their means. Um, so he associated uh, all of these um, legacy of, of, of Spanish rule and culture as, as negative because in his view was what prompted his father uh, to behave the way uh, he did. So that was, in my opinion, very, very important in his upbringing. The second important uh, factor is that, uh, as I said earlier, Samiento was not able to finish a formal education um, when he was uh, living uh, in San Juan. He, 
when he went in political into political exile in Chile, he did uh, finish his education, he had some degrees, and uh, you know he basically improved his standing, what we would call today uh, social mobility, and and became uh, an important figure, became a you know a a, a very important uh, commentator of the time. But this was after he left uh, his, the place where he was born. Um, and that, that also, I think, is very, very, it's an important uh, factor in his, in his opinion, in, in the formulation of, his, of this dichotomous uh, characterization of society. Finally, I think it's fair to say that when we talk about the mid 19th century, uh, the, 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 the differences, the, um, the separation between uh, the urban areas and the countryside in Latin Americans were very, very profound. So, so it, Sarmiento was a, a man who traveled extensively and he did not stay in cities alone. He traveled extensively all over Latin America and he saw a, a pattern that was very, very common at the time, which was a pattern of a very vibrant urban cities and a very neglected uh, parts of the interior of the country. Now, let me say uh, one thing that I think is also very important um, and, and to some extent it played into this characterization. When Samiento was in exile in Chile, he began to read a lot of the literature of uh, European thinkers of the time. And, and this idea of characterizing society in a dichotomous way was very prevalent among many intellectuals uh, in Europe. For example, if you read a sociologist by the name of Emil Durkheim, uh, he talks about in, in his book, The Division of Labor, you know, he talks about the idea of mechanic versus organic solidarity. Again, a dichotomous situation, okay? If you talk about Karl Marx, for example, uh, Marx uh, believed that because of the development of industrialization, there were two important classes that were antagonistic uh, to, to one another, the working class and the, and the bourgeoisie of, of the, the elite. So, so this idea of looking at society in a dichotomous way was not original of Sarmientos. Uh, was, what was original of him was to apply it to Latin America and to, in, in a very detrimental way and in a very uh, controversial way, depict uh, anything that was not progress or that he didn't see as progress as barbaric, which of course is an oversimplification. You touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, given that Sarmiento saw this division between urban and rural communities, did he see any solutions to bridge those differences? The solution for him, uh, the, the, the short-term solution that he dedicated all of his life to it was to promote education. He believed that education was the way out uh, of poverty. The, the education was a way to transform uh, our societies and to open up opportunities. So he was very keen in promoting schools, adapting uh, new pedagogical strategies in his, in his schools. Uh, he actually, uh, when he was in exile in Chile, he taught in a, in a private institute for a while uh, to, to make a living. Um, he was very, very keen to education. And as I said earlier, uh, the, at least the formal reason why uh, the Chileans sponsored this trip uh, to him was so that he would look at education system and would bring new ideas that, revolution, that would revolutionize uh, the education in, um, in Argentina and primarily in Chile because the Chileans were sponsoring the trip. When Sarmiento was president of Argentina, he uh, brought important um, uh, educational reforms to the country. And, and he was, by the way, he was a, in many ways very progressive. He, he promoted the education of, of women as long as, 
also an education of men. He wasn't uh, just promoting education of men alone. So in many ways, he was a very progressive uh, thinker in this regard, very open and very inclusive, uh, but, but at the same time, very determined uh, to, to characterize anything that didn't fit his notion of progress as barbaric, which of course, as I, as I have said multiple times, is a, is a, a great oversimplification. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Pumar, for your presentation tonight. Um, it's been really informative. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to thank you from uh, the city of Alexandria and from the Office of Historic Alexandria. And um, I wish you uh, and everyone who's still here uh, a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you all, all of you who attended and, and, and those who, who asked questions. It was very, very enjoyable. I enjoyed it very much. I hope we can do it again. Thank you. <laughs> Me too. Take care. Take care. Thanks.